Well, hi everyone. Um, I'm sorry I had some uh, some te technical difficulties, um, but thanks for for bearing with me. And I'd like to introduce myself today. My name is uh, Mike Fitz, and I'm a park ranger here at Katmai National Park. And um, this is kind of a, n a new thing for me. What I'm going to try to do is um, give you a brief overview of Brooks Camp in Katmai National Park, which is the most popular destination within the park and preserve. And then I want to try to uh, answer as many questions as possible. So if you have the ability to, uh, if you're watching this right now on, on Google+, you should be able to uh, have an option to ask me questions directly in there. If you have the ability to, to comment on, on, uh, on YouTube, then you should be able to um, post questions there and then on Facebook as well. And we'll do our best to try to monitor those. I have a, a secret helper with me um, who, who is monitoring all those questions right now. So through all of those feeds, we're going to try to do our best to answer your questions, give you an overview of Brooks Camp, what it's like there, because um, it's, it's a really spectacular place. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be showing and sharing a few screens with you uh, Different, different aspects of Brooks Camp along the way, for instance. So let me bring one of those things up, because I have a, a few photos that I definitely want to share with you. Because uh, Brooks Camp, I, I think, is a really spectacular place. And it's extremely popular, of course, for its bear watching opportunities. It's also extremely popular for its uh, fishing opportunities as well. And today, nearly 10,000 people visit Brooks Camp each year, primarily to see bears, but also to fish. And there's, there's a ton of other recreational opportunities in the area as well. And of course, almost everybody comes in July to see bears at Brooks Falls. But there are also many other bear watching opportunities around Brooks Camp, not just at the falls and not just in July, and we'll talk about some of those things a little bit later, but there's also bear watching opportunities at the mouth of the Brooks River and in many other places along the river. And many of these bear viewing opportunities really give you remarkably intimate experiences with these bears. You can safely watch bears from wildlife viewing platforms that are staged along the river. And when you're doing that, you can look down on many of these bears just behaving naturally. So it's a, it's a really fantastic experience, and I, I really, really enjoy being out there. Of course, almost everybody arrives via float plane, too. And that's a pretty unique experience for a lot of people as well. Most people who come to Brooks Camp have not flown on a plane that small before they actually before they actually get there. And of course we have a campground as well, and we'll be answering a lot of questions about the campground, I'm sure. And then uh, we have a, a lodge at Brooks Camp as well. So if you're not in the camping, maybe you can stay at the lodge. So those are a few things that we have here at Brooks Camp. But I'm going to minimize this screen. And I am going to bring up another screen here in just a second. And I see we do have one question popping up. So I'm going to, I'm going to get to that in just a moment. So thank you for posting that. But there's a, there was a few other things that I wanted to show you here, too. And that happens to be just a, actually a map of Katmai National Park and Preserve. Because I do realize that sometimes people come here, and they actually don't know where the heck they are, which is understandable. I mean, if you fly from, let's say, uh, where I grew up in Pennsylvania, you end up going from uh, Pennsylvania maybe to uh, Chicago, maybe to Anchorage, and then you have to fly on a tiny little bush plane all the way to King Salmon. So when I enlarge this for you, you're looking at this little map of Alaska here. It's 
So Katmai National Park and Preserve is located right at the head of the Brooks River. Or, excuse me, right at the head of the Alaska Peninsula. And then within Katmai National Park and Preserve, Brooks Camp is not quite in the center. It's more on the western part of the park itself. And most people, were fl they fly to Anchorage, uh, and then they end up flying to King Salmon, and then maybe out to Brooks Camp from there. So when you're arranging your flights, that's something to consider. It's, um, there are companies that, that offer packages to get from Anchorage to Brooks Camp, and maybe you want to explore those options. Some people just buy all their tickets separately. They'll maybe buy commercial airline tickets from Anchorage to King Salmon, and then from there, they'll buy um, a plane ticket out to Brooks Camp. And there are many different um, commercial operators that will fly you from King Salmon to Brooks Camp. However, only one of them really offers seat fares, and that's the park's concessionaire. Uh, and you can find, and I'll show you their website um, later on in the chat. But, uh, you know, you may want to consider if you have a large group chartering a plane as well. It's, that's going to be pretty pricey just for one or two people. Seat fares are generally more economical. But if you have a, a large group of people with a lot of equipment, maybe you can find someone to fly you out there that's... Uh, that's a better deal for you, but that's something um, for you to explore. So from King Salmon to Brooks Camp, it's, it's uh, I believe, nearly 60 miles. So it's a long way out there, and there's no road that connects King Salmon uh, to Brooks Camp itself. And uh, I, I do see a question that we... Uh, that came up a little bit ago, so I'm going to try to try to get to that now because I think that'll maybe lead me into some of the other things that I wanted to discuss with you uh, because I wanted to talk about, of course, what you can do with Brooks Camp uh, and when the best time to go would be. And, and the question that I'm, I'm seeing says, I'm thinking of visiting the first week of September. Is Brooks Falls crowded at this time? And Brooks Falls actually in September is not very crowded. Let me pull up a picture for you here. And I'll explain the reason why Brooks Falls isn't necessarily crowded at that time of the year. Okay, so I'm going to have to cycle through a few photographs here to find the right one that I was um, thinking of. So and this is a typical September scene. The one reason why uh, Brooks Falls isn't crowded at this time of the year, in September, for instance, is because most of the bears really aren't actually fishing there. So let me back up, and I'll cycle through these real quick. And to give you a sort of a longer answer to your question, when you're looking at uh, the time to go to Brooks Camp in, in Katmai National Park, especially if you want to see bears, you got to go in particular seasons because if you come too early, for instance, like you're seeing in this photo right now, there's not going to be any bears around. This photo was taken in May, and there's really no food sources at, at the Brooks River in May to concentrate bears there. So if you come in May and early June, for instance, you're going to have a hard time actually finding bears. Bears are definitely in the area, but they're very dispersed. They're not really concentrating in any one spot. So occasionally a bear wanders through, for instance, but you don't necessarily see them um, at, at the river at that time of the year. However, if you, if you want to come to fish, then definitely I would consider June and August, times of the year when we have less bears, because it's, it's a lot easier to fish when you don't have to move out of a bear's way every 10 minutes. And a lot of anglers will say definitely uh, that in certain seasons, you spend more time actually avoiding bears than you actually spend with your line in the water. So if you are fishing, definitely consider June and August as your best times to come visit. Brooks Falls is extremely popular with people who want to watch bears in July, and for good reason, too, because in July, that's when the salmon are, are pushing up actually to Brooks Falls. And that creates a temporary barrier for these migrating salmon. And it makes a, a really great spot for the bears to fish. So 
July, for instance, the viewing platforms up at Brooks Falls are actually very crowded, and that's something to consider, too. The two peak times of bear viewing here uh, at Brooks Camp happen to be the month of July and the month of September. And they have, adv they have advantages and disadvantages. You'll see in different bear behaviors in July versus in September, for instance. The bears in July they tend to be a bit more aggressive towards one another because they most of them haven't had a good meal at all for well since they went to their dens in October and November so they're a little bit more aggressive towards one another they're competing for food sources in, in a fairly small area although you will find bears fishing in other places uh, along the river in July but July is the most popular month to come to Brooks Camp and, and, and watch bears and the falls viewing platform is limited to 40 people at a time. So if you come here in July, especially if you're wanting to watch bears at Brooks Falls in the middle of the day, then definitely uh, you, you may expect um, a waiting uh, period. Just like if you go to a busy restaurant, for instance, and you, for, uh, and you experience a wait there. Same thing happens at our viewing platforms um, in July. We don't necessarily have that in September. There's also another viewing platform up near Brooks Falls as well that offers really great wildlife viewing opportunities. And this sometimes this viewing platform at the Riffles sometimes plays second fiddle to uh, what we have, uh, you know, up at the falls. But there's there's definitely some great things to see here. The Riffles platform is just about a hundred yards downstream of the falls. Oftentimes we have mothers with cubs fishing there, for instance. Uh, it's also a great place to watch spawning salmon later in the season too. Then if you move further downstream from the falls, then you also have really great opportunities to watch bears actively chasing fish. A lot of the really big guys that fish up at Brooks Falls, those real dominant males, they don't necessarily like to move around because fishing up at the falls can be really easy when you're sitting in one spot. Down at the mouth of the river though or down at the riffles, you're going to see a bit more uh, of a bit more active fishing techniques. Bears chasing fish back and back and forth. Sometimes they're successful, a lot of times they're not. But that's a really great opportunity for you to do that as well. And this picture was taken from what we have nicknamed the Lower um, River Platform. And that's a, a, a wildlife viewing platform right at the mouth of the Brooks River. And this is a picture taken across the river looking at that wildlife viewing platform. So you see a bear in the river at the bottom of this photo and then her cubs are staged right below um, the people up on up on the, the viewing platform. So that's a really spectacular place to be. Uh, in July, it's worth spending at least some time there. Definitely go to Brooks Falls. You want to go to Brooks Falls in July. But if you're coming here in September, the lower river platform is definitely the place to be. And it, it can get crowded, but it, it generally doesn't get crowded to the point where you happen to experience issues associated finding some, some shoulder room to get good views of bears. September doesn't seem to have the heavy levels of visitation that July does. So if you come to Brooks Falls uh, in, in the Brooks River in July, you're actually not going to find a lot of bears fishing up at Brooks Falls. You'll find them all at the mouth of the river. Uh, so this was a picture taken um, early in the morning um, in September a couple years ago. And I count one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight bears just in that frame. And I took this photo just with my little point-and-shoot camera, so uh, it's not that difficult. Excuse me, I skipped ahead a little bit. It's not that difficult to find bears here in September. All of the salmon at that time of the year are, are spawning and they're beginning to die. And as they begin to die, they drift downstream and their carcasses collect at the mouth of the river where you're going to find uh, the bears happen to fish. The bears are going to follow their, their, their noses. They're going to follow their noses to the food source food sources and they know that the dead and dying fish happen to collect at the mouth of the river and at the beginning of Knack Knack Lake. So you don't really find a lot of bears up at Brooks Falls in September. And this is a picture of Brooks Falls in September. There is one bear in the middle of the photograph. It's just sort of facing downstream looking for some fish there. And occasionally, you know, bears will fish there. And certain bears, I should say, will fish there fairly consistent, consistently in September. But if you see really more than two bears fishing at the falls in September, you're, you're going to be pretty darn lucky. Because 
the, the fish just aren't migrating to the falls. The falls is no longer that stopgap that it was before. Fish are all through the water there, but they're fairly dispersed, and the fish that are through the water there are still fairly energetic. And since they're dispersed, they're fairly energetic, and they're at low densities, it makes it, makes it hard for bears to actually catch them. So we don't find a lot of bears finding that Brooks Falls is a, is a successful place to fish in September. And consequently, that's why you don't see a lot of, a lot of bears up there. And then you, you, know, you can continue the logic through that. If there's not a lot of bears at Brooks Falls in September, then there's really not going to be a lot of people. So the actual wildlife viewing platform up at Brooks Falls in September is not very crowded, which can be actually a good thing, um, just depending on whether you really wanted to avoid the crowds. Uh, there will be, of course, people around in September, but, we, but it's, it certainly is not like the crowds that we experience in July. And while I'm on the topic of the sort of things to do at Brooks Camp, you know, we talked about fishing uh, just briefly. Uh, I went into some detail about bear watching and when to come, and I can't reiterate enough. The best times to come for bear watching is July and September. But one of the other things that you can consider when you happen to come here uh, happens to be whether or not you want to go see the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. And the Valley of 10,000 Smokes is a really spectacular landscape. It's one of the uh, very unique features on the face of the earth. When you are at the end of the road on the Valley of 10,000 Smokes bus tour, and it is a bus tour, um, you, you're greeted with this view of a landscape that was filled in with, with, in some places, hundreds of feet of volcanic ash and pumice. So it's a really amazing landscape that was formed over 60 hours on, um, from, from uh, June 6th through 9th, 1912. And this landscape was the reason Katmai National Monument was established in 1918 because of this really uh, uniquely devastated uh, volcanic landscape. So that's something to consider as well. Uh, the, there is a fee charged for this tour, um, and it's close to $100. I apologize. I can't remember exactly what that happens to be. But the, you can purchase tickets uh, for that uh, on site when you happen to come to Brooks Camp. You can purchase them in advance if you know exactly when you happen to be coming as well too. So if you maybe want to take a break from bears, then definitely uh, consider the Valley of 10,000 Smokes tour. Maybe you'll get lucky, maybe not, I don't know, it depends on your perspective. You might have me as your guide and we actually do a hike that's an optional hike at the end of the end of the bus ride to hike down to the valley floor itself where you can see the, the streams carving down through the ash layer. You get to explore the pumice and some of the really unique geology associated with that landscape. So that's a really amazing experience as well. And we have other ranger-led programs as well. We have a very easy and short walk that talks about the cultural history of the Brooks River area. And that's often something that we don't realize when we're walking along the river is just how rich uh, the Brooks River area is in human history. People have been using the river uh, for for nearly 5,000 years, and, and fairly continuously, with a couple uh, breaks in time here and there, but there's a, a ton of archaeology, a ton of cultural history associated with the Brooks area as well, and we do have a walk uh, for that every day. We also have an evening program as well, too, and that talks, of course, about the big topics that people come uh, to Brooks Camp in, uh, to experience. Of course, bears, salmon, volcanoes, uh, cultural history, um, who, uh, you know, uh, the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, you name it, we can, we can talk about that. So that's some different things to consider too. So I'm going to minimize this and uh, I see I have um, another question here about, uh, about camping. So let's see here. <clears throat> And uh, one question that came up, and this is being forwarded to me, not through um, through Google+, Plus, but uh, I'm going to try to get to you. Yeah, I know I see a, a bunch of questions coming up in the queue here, so I'm going to do my best to get to those. Um, and before I get to some of those that are off topic of camping, I'm gonna, I, I do want to talk about camping with everyone. So let me bring up some other photos of the campground, because I know sometimes people are wondering what our campground actually looks like. And, you know, there's a lot of unique campgrounds across the nation. However, the Brooks Camp Campground actually is one of the most unique campgrounds I think you'll ever have the opportunity to experience. So let me make this bigger for you so you can actually see it. One of the things that really makes the Brooks Camp Campground unique 
happens to be that it's surrounded by an electric fence. And that is uh, to help protect bears and also people as well. But you have to remember that the Brooks Camp uh, uh, campground, even though it's surrounded by an electric fence, that you, when you're staying in it, you have to take special precautions to make sure that bears don't have any temptations to really test the fence. Because the fence is bear resistant, but it's not bear proof. It's just a, 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 an electric fence designed for livestock, uh, so it holds back cattle very well. It, it'll hold back a curious bear. You know, it, it sends a, a pretty painful shock through their nose, for instance, if they happen to touch it with their nose or their paws. And a lot of times when bears are investigating things out of curiosity, they'll first touch it with, the, with their nose or their mouth or their paws. So that jolt of electricity sends them a message to stay away. But a really strongly motivated bear is going to be able to get through that fence really easily. So when you're in the campground, you have to take special precautions to make sure that you um, the bears don't have a temptation to go through the fence itself. And inside of the campground, I'll go over some of the facilities for you here. There are, there are no designated sites, so it's sort of a shared area. There's a lot of places where you will be able to see that people have pitched their tents, and virtually anywhere that you find is a comfortable spot to pitch your tent, you're welcome to do so. So there's no designate, designated sites in the campground, and when the campground is full, uh, you may have somebody camped fairly close to you, so definitely expect that as well. And if you're sensitive to snoring or something like that, then then bring some earplugs in case somebody with a who's a snorer puts uh, puts their tent pretty close to you. There's three designated cooking shelters and eating shelters uh, in in the campground, and this is really where you should be eating um, and cooking your food. And th in this way, we can concentrate odors in these places and not around people's tents. We don't want food odors, of course, around somebody's tents. So when you cook and eat in the cooking shelter, then you concentrate food odors there. If you happen to spill anything on the ground, it's concentrated there. And if a bear does go through the fence and it's motivated by those food odors, it's more likely to investigate the cooking shelters and not your tent. So we are trying to re reduce our bear and human conflicts in this area by uh, having everybody eat in and prepare their food only in the cooking shelters itself. You can have a fire. You can see that there's a fire ring in front of the cooking shelter, but you can only collect dead and down wood um, to build those fires. And the fires really, you should only use them for atmosphere. Don't use them to cook over. Only, you know, cook over a stove, plan on doing that. Some people just boil water and they use um, dehydrated, dehydrated meals. Others are a bit more elaborate in their meal planning and preparation. But it's up to you, too. You can stay in the campground and eat at the lodge. The, the lodge does offer three meals per day. So if you wanted to go that route, you can certainly do so. So here's another photograph of, of another cooking shelter. And then the building in the background actually is, is our food and gear cache. So when you're in the campground as well, you want to store all your extra equipment that you don't really immediately need inside of the gear cache. And that way, if a bear happens to go into the campground, and let's say it's during the middle of the day, it decides, hey, there's a tent over here, and I want to investigate it, it tears into the tent. At least you'll have you know, your dry clothing and everything like that inside of the gear cache. And there's potable water down in the campground, too. So there's a water faucet at the gear cache and food cache. So separate rooms for food and gear, and this is a picture of the, of the food cache. It does get crowded in there um, in July when the campground is full. It does get uh, smelly in there as well. Uh, so do your best to keep it clean. We try to do our best too, but oftentimes we're not really sure whose food is what. So we can't just go in there and start yanking stuff out, lest someone will come to the visitor center tomorrow and uh, or the next day and they'll say, hey, what you, what you do with my food? I was hungry last night because I couldn't find my dinner. And then a gear cache as well too. So you can store your extra things in here, your bags, your backpacks, extra clothing and it'll be safe and sound for many uh, curious bears. And of course there's bathrooms in the campground too. And the, the, one of the questions that came up associated with the campground that I, uh, I can answer now um, happens to be uh, if, if you're camping do you need to bring your own cooking stove um, and where do you get propane from? And that's a pretty good question, something to consider uh, before um, before you arrive is 
how you're going to do your cooking when you're staying in the campground, what type of fuel you're going to use. Uh, you you want to bring your own stove with you. There are no stove rentals at Brooks Camp. You can't purchase any stoves from the trading post at the lodge in the visitor center. Um, you know, our bookstore that the National Park Service runs, we don't have a... a we don't, we don't have any stoves there. So you want to make sure that, that you're bringing your stove with you. And there's a hiccup with that. So if you're, if you're bringing a stove, obviously, and you're flying commercially, you're not going to be able to bring your stove fuel with you. So what are you going to do? Well, what you got to do is you got to purchase your fuel while you're there. So you can't purchase a stove or you can't rent a stove, but you can purchase your fuel at Brooks Camp. So as long as you're not using a stove that is uh, that uses a, a really unique type of fuel, for instance, you're going to be able to find um, uh, the right type of, of fuel at Brooks Lodge for purchase. So if you're using a, um, a propane stove, you can find uh, propane canisters like the big Coleman uh, canisters. You can find those uh, at Brooks Lodge. You can find the smaller uh, propane canisters as well that fit um, a small backpacking stove like MSR, MSR uh, a stove. So if you have um, a little pocket rocket stove, um, they have fuel for that. Uh, if you have a jet boil, they have fuel for that as well. And if you have uh, something that uses white gas, uh, like a MSR Whisper Light, for instance, then um, then you can purchase uh, purchase fuel for that too. There's also a fuel in Gear Cash. This just in. Oh, okay. So <laughs> this just in from our news desk. Um, so um, Ranger Roy's here. Say hi, Roy. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so I can explain, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, there have been a couple of cases of TSA uh, people confiscating uh, stoves because they detect a gas residue in them. So if you have one that uses liquid fuel, it might be in your best interest to leave that at home and just rent one from the lodge. Oh, I just got done telling everyone they don't. Oh, they do rent. They do oh, rent they like do. Coleman. You know the classic Coleman little. They're too heavy to go, really to go backpacking in for most people. The stove itself. The, the stove itself. Oh, okay. Yeah, they okay. do rent those. Right. It's like it's like um, uh, a few of a tank of gas filled in five dollars a day or ten dollars a day, and then you buy whatever gas you need. Oh, it's okay. Not too bad. Okay. Better than losing your stove if TSA decides that it has too much fuel residue on it and it's a hazard. Okay. So, anyway, that's my two cents. All right. Now. All right. Well, good to know. So, thank you for that clarification. Um, so, if you are, uh, if you're in doubt, then um, give the park a call. Um, you know, you can find our contact information on on the, the park website. You can also, um, you know, also call uh, TSA uh, or your um, commercial airlines that you're flying with too, um, if you have any uh, doubts about that. But uh, yeah, I would probably plan on bringing my own stove and then purchasing at the lodge. There is a fuel cache down in the campground, and a lot of times people end up using their unused fuel there because they can't, you know, they're not going to be able to take it back to Wisconsin or Pennsylvania, wherever they happen to be going with them. Um, so they often will leave it there. So when you arrive, instead of going down to the lodge and purchasing fuel right away, maybe you want to wander to the campground, set up your tent and whatnot, and then check the fuel cache. See if there's anything left in there that, that's labeled free to a good home or whatever it happens to be. So um, that's a little bit about the, about the campground. And again, if you have any more questions about the campground, please post those, and I'll, um, I'll try to get to those. Um, one of the other things, uh, and I'll, maybe I should bring up a picture of the Brooks Falls platform once again. Whoops. Let me share that screen with you here. Because one of the other questions that came up is, how long is the viewing session? at Brooks Falls. And that is oftentimes uh, something, let's see here, let me find it. There it is. That is something is sometimes a concern for people is you don't want to travel uh, thousands of miles and then all of a sudden not be able to you know have a, a, a good bit of time to, to watch bears at Brooks Falls. So let me maximize this for everybody so I can see it too. So I'm going to go back to a picture here um, of Brooks Falls. 
Because it, it looks like, you know, from this photo, it looks like there's a lot of space up at Brooks Falls. But the Brooks Falls viewing platform is actually kind of small, and it's limited to 40 people at a time. So what happens when there's a, the, the Falls platform is at a 40-person capacity? We limit everyone's time out there to one hour at a time. In that way, uh, we can rotate everybody through and give everyone some access to Brooks Falls. So when there is a wait list to, uh, for people to go to Brooks Falls, the people who are out there are limited to one hour at a time. They're not limited to an hour a day, just an hour at a time and only when people are waiting. So if you happen to come early in the morning, for instance, uh, when the Falls platform isn't crowded, you can stay there for many hours until we reach our 40-person capacity. And then once we reach that 40-person capacity, we're going to ask you to yield your spot so we can rotate other, other people through. So that's a, again, that's something um, that I, I want to make clear to everybody is that um, you don't have an hour a day, just an hour at a time. But in the middle of the day, from probably 10 a.m. to 3 to 4 p.m., the Falls platform is very crowded. And during the month of July, almost every day in July, we have a, a significant wait list during those hours. Sometimes we're lucky. Um, well, for the people who are at Brooks Camp, um, and there's not a wait list, but a lot of times that's weather dependent. Uh, if it's foggy in King Salmon, for instance, there's a there's a lot of people who are stacked up in King Salmon waiting to come out to Brooks Camp to view bears, and they can't get there because they have to wait for the fog to lift so the planes can fly. Uh, so there there are is certainly times where we don't experience as much crowding, but that is something to expect in the middle of the of the day uh, in July. So uh, let's see here. Um, a couple other questions as well. Um, and uh, let's see. This one from uh, whose uh, screen name here is is Bear Lover, and that's a pretty pretty good name, I guess. If you're if you're going to come to to Brooks Camp, definitely uh, you you gotta love love the bears that are there. Um, so Bear Lover asks. Uh, let's see. What other things besides the Valley of Ten Thousand Smokes are there to do? when the Falls platform is crowded in July. Uh, our walks along the roads, down the spit, um, along the beach. Um, can we see Ranger Roy's cabin? <laughs> yeah, you can. I don't know if I'm going to... And, and Roy is in the office across here, so he can hear me uh, speaking to that. Um, I, I, I don't know if I want to reveal where Roy's cabin is to everybody. You'll see it, though. It's, it's right on the beach. <laughs> So, yeah, you'll see it. Um, your, your options of exploring the area around Brooks Camp are, are, are nearly unlimited. There's not a lot of developed trails in the area. There's a trail to Brooks Falls. There's a trail to what we call the cultural site, which uh, we take people on um, during our guided walks. And you can go there, too, if you don't want to go on our guided, guided walks about the cultural history of the Brooks Camp area. Um, there's a trail up Dumpling Mountain, for instance. So I, I know a lot of you who maybe are watching... Um, uh, the Hangout right now, the, you're familiar with the cams, you're maybe a little bit familiar with uh, the landscape around Brooks Camp and Dumpling Mountain, and if you wanted to go onto Dumpling Mountain and try to find some of those dens that our Brooks River Bears go into, then you can certainly do that. So there's a trail up there, for instance. The, the road out to the Valley of 10,000 Smokes is 23 miles in length, so it's a long walk to get there, but you're certainly welcome to do that. And you can also walk along the beach, too. You can walk down the beach, uh, from uh, from you know the main Brooks Camp area um, along Naknek Lake, which can be a really gorgeous walk if you wanted to do that as well. So if you're looking to avoid maybe the the crowds at Brooks Falls in July, then definitely um, check that out as something to do. And if you're into bird watching, other wildlife watching, for instance, the the Brooks River area is a great place to be as well. Uh, there's a lot of different habitats kind of packed into a small area. So you got the river, you got the lake. You have uh, edges of marshes and forests, and all of these things really blend together. And you can see in the in July, for instance, when we have all of our uh, migrant breeding birds at Brooks Camp, you can easily see two dozen species um, per day there, and sometimes more. And every year, there's something really strange that shows up at Brooks Camp that I've never seen before. Uh, and there are sometimes first records of birds 
uh, for the Alaska Peninsula that show up at Brooks Camp. So some really great stuff that you can, that you can see out there. And I definitely would recommend um, bringing binoculars, not only for bird watching, but also for bear watching too. Binoculars are one of those sort of essential naturalist tools that I always have with me when I'm walking outside. So I definitely would recommend that. And that you're really free to wander wherever you feel um, comfortable doing so. Except at Brooks Falls in July, there's an area around Brooks Falls from June 15th to August 15th where um, entry is prohibited to all people. So you have to go around that area. And when you come to Brooks Camp, if you're um, interested in knowing where those boundaries are, um, you can ask at the visitor center, and we'll, we'll certainly let you know um, where those where those boundaries are. But virtually anywhere else is is wide open. Not a lot of trails, but it's a great place to explore. So if you're in the bushwhacking, for instance, you wanted to explore different habitats, um, do some bog tromping, for instance. I love walking through bogs, so definitely uh, try to uh, you know try to uh, go um, you know e explore some of the some of the bogs as well, and bring your head net if you want to do that to keep the mosquitoes and black flies off you as well. So let's see a couple other questions here that are coming up in the queue. Uh, and I realize I'm about 40 minutes in right now, so I probably should uh, reintroduce myself. And uh, if you came in a little bit late and you missed the beginning, uh, my name is Mike Fitz, and I'm a park ranger here at Katmai National Park and Preserve. And this is, as you probably have already realized, an informational sort of chat and hangout about planning your trip to Brooks Camp. So I'm just uh, right now answering uh, questions that are coming up in the queue. And, and please, if you're watching this on Google+, Plus, post those there. Uh, and I'll do my best to try to answer those, um, post them on Facebook, and then also um, if you uh, have the ability to comment on YouTube and you're watching this directly on YouTube, then you can um, post your questions there as well too. So let's see, let me uh, take a moment to browse some of our questions here. Um, let's see, what is the, uh, the earliest time you can go to a viewing platform in the morning? So that that's kind of dependent on the time of the year uh, because the uh, and and the location um, so let me so let me back up and and, uh, and start again so uh, so what's the earliest time that you can go to a viewing platform in the morning yes it's, it's certainly dependent on the location of the platform and the time of the year so from June 15th to August 15th, the the whole boardwalk and, and wildlife viewing complex up at Brooks Falls, and that includes not only the Brooks Falls platform, but also the uh, the Riffles platform as well. And let me bring up um, a little. I'm going to bring up the park map again, because uh, and share that with everybody again, because there's a Brooks Camp map in there that will help to um, illustrate this a little bit better for everybody. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, zoom in here quite a bit to show everyone sort of like this Brooks Camp inset here. Let me navigate to that. Here we are. Okay. So up at Brooks Falls, there are, and I'm not sure if you can see um, my mouse or the hand for my mouse pointer here, but up at Brooks Falls, there's those two wildlife viewing platforms, the Falls platform and the Riffles platform. And from June 15th to August 15th, those are closed at 10 p.m. and they reopen at 7 a.m. So inside of those hours, overnight, you can't go to the Falls platform. And the reason for this is to allow the bears that aren't tolerant of people fishing at, at Brooks Falls. Oh, and it seems like my connection dropped. So I hope that you can still see me here. So bear with me, everybody. If you can still see me, I need to type a message to my helper. and see if she can see me here. So we're kind of a long way from anywhere, even in King Salmon, so a lot of times our connections do drop.
see. All right. So it sounds like my sound and everything is dropping here and there, and that may be a, an issue with our connection, but I'll... I can hear you fine. Okay, so maybe it's only my helper's connection that is dropping. <laughs> I'll blame that on her. Um, so... You haven't skipped the word over here. Okay, alright, so... Uh, so thanks for your patience, everybody, with this. Um, so let me um, pull up that... Yeah, that screen is still there for everybody to see. So yeah, June 15th to August 15th, the Falls platform and Ruffles platform in that boardwalk complex up there is closed from 10, 10 a.m. to uh, 7 a.m. So you can get there at 7 a.m. and you can stay there all day if you wanted to and, uh, and leave at 10 p.m. And oftentimes in July, for instance, you'll find me up there until 10 p.m. and we leave after that. And I think I was also mentioning that it closes, that area closes at 10 p.m. to allow bears who aren't tolerant of the presence of people the opportunity to come down to fish without our prying eyes. There are some bears that are so intolerant of people that they won't even go down to the falls to fish when people are there. And there are other bears that maybe we'll come down to the falls during the day to fish, but they don't come near the platforms and use some of the fishing spots near the platforms because uh, the, the people are just a little bit too close. After August 15th, for instance, you can be up there all night if you wanted to, but of course it's going to be dark and there's not going to be a lot of bears fishing there. So if you're there in September, uh, you know, going up to the falls at night probably isn't worthwhile because uh, it's going to be dark. You're not going to be able to see anything, and there's not going to be a lot of bears around. And certainly, I don't. In September, for instance, when the sun starts to set at 8:30, I don't want to be walking back to my campsite or, or or my cabin if you're staying at the lodge in the dark. Um, so, uh, oftentimes, I'm I'm ready to to hunker down by uh, by 8 8:30 p.m. just because I don't want. Uh, to be walking um, along the trails in, in limited daylight with a lot of bears around. Because the bears have all the advantages with low light. Sense of smell is better than us. Uh, they can hear just as well as us. They can see better uh, than us. And of course, they're so strong, so smart, um, and so quick that uh, you know in the dark, they really do have all the advantages. But with the lower river platform, that remains um, open 24-7 uh, year-round. So if you wanted to be there, um, during the month of July, even at 1 a.m., for instance, when you do have a lot of daylight, you're welcome to do so. So the lower river platform down at the, uh, at the mouth, that's certainly a place um, that's, that's really good in the morning, for instance, when there's not a lot of people around and also sometimes in the evening as well, too, when you have um, you know, the bears coming out of the woods, for instance, in, in the area. And I, I really love being on the lower river platform in September. So uh, that's the place where you're going to find me most often in September when I'm out bear watching is going to be at, at the lower river platform. So let's see here. I got a, a bunch of more questions popping up, which is, which is uh, good here. All right. And some people did see the map, so thank you very much for commenting on that. All right. So let's see here. So... And um, I apologize if I am pronouncing your name wrong. I think this is this is Mocha from uh, Explore.org. But uh, Amalia um, asks, let's see, uh, if you have a lot of gear, what is the best way to get there? You know, really the uh, the only way to to get it there is on a float plane, unless somehow you were able to find somebody in King Sam and the charter a boat. For boat for you. Um, and I, I'm not really sure anyone really offers that service. It may be worth investigating. I mean, you never know. But uh, generally, you know, flying commercially, you're limited to a couple of bags and they're limited to uh, 50 pounds if you happen to check them or something like that. So oftentimes you end up paying excess baggage fees. If you're coming in July, uh, there's, you know, a lot of people moving in and out of the King Salmon Airport. And sometimes your bags don't always get there with you. So I would, honestly, I would, I would try to, um, especially if you're camping, you don't have to go ultralight like you're um, hiking the Appalachian Trail, but I would really seriously consider whittling down what you think you absolutely need, for instance, um, to help reduce your weight and the number of bags that you happen to be carrying. Uh, think about um, 
the range of temperatures that you're going to experience at Brooks Camp. If you're coming in July, 40 degrees uh, Fahrenheit is generally the low. So, you know, five, six degrees Celsius. Um, our high temperatures rarely reach 80 degrees. Most of the time, our high temperatures are much lower than that. They're usually in the 60s, sometimes in the, the low 50s, though, um, during the month of July, depending on if we have some cold weather off of the Bering Sea move into the area. So uh, think, of, think really seriously about the, the amount of clothing that you think you need. Uh, I would say definitely a good rain jacket is essential. Long underwear, too. Instead of really bringing, um, you know, uh, uh, let's um, instead, yeah, instead of bringing maybe like a space heater with you, then bring some really heavy, uh, heavy duty long underwear, um, and you maybe a good sleeping bag that you know um, is going to keep you warm at night. So, um, if there is uh, any. Uh, anything that you're specifically curious about whether or not you need, then maybe you can pop that into um, into the, the Q&A window, and I can try to get to that. But yeah, um, maybe browse some backpacking websites. Try to get some ideas about how people minimize for trips ex you know, that are extended periods of time, weeks or sometimes months, and um, people are living essentially with what they just have on their backpack. I'm not saying that you, can, you just have to bring one t-shirt. But um, you know, that's something to consider if you're really concerned about baggage fees and, and having just a lot of stuff with you. So let's see here. A couple other people. Um, oh yeah, and so yeah, a question related to uh, you know what I was just answering before. If um, and it, this is from um, Amalia again. Um, if I bring a blind. Uh, you know, heating uh, stove. Um, would I be able to use it as a heater in my tent? There's nothing to prohibit you from doing that in regulation. Uh, however, there's probably some safety issues that I I would uh, I would say you shouldn't do it for. Um, for instance, you know, the possibility of setting your tent on fire. Um, you know, a lot of the tent fabrics are fire resistant, but they're not fireproof, and I think the wording labels say that if they're in contact with a flame for long enough, then they will burn. So uh, you don't want to, of course, um, tip your tent tent over and and burn a hole in it, for instance. You also have to worry about carbon monoxide as well, too. And you know, I'm not sure that all stove really the stoves produce carbon monoxide, but if you have a tent that's really sealed well from the outside atmosphere, it's really good at blocking the wind, uh, and you don't really have a lot of air circulation within there, then carbon monoxide can be, um, can be a danger. So I, for those reasons, I probably wouldn't worry about uh, bringing a, a, a stove into the tent to heat with. My system is, is a, a, a decent sleeping bag that's rated to probably about 30 degrees, for the summertime in Katmai, that's that's usually plenty, and you can find some really lightweight sleeping bags on the market that only weigh a, a couple pounds or so. So I, I would recommend uh, a lightweight sleeping bag and a sleeping pad as well too, because if you're not insulated from the ground, a lot of your body heat is going to go straight through your sleeping bag and directly into the ground, and you're not really going to be able to heat up the earth underneath you very well. So bring a sleeping pad with you, and oftentimes those weigh. Uh, a pound or less. I just have a thin, uh, thin. It's the brand is called a Thinsulate flat pad, and I'm not recommending that above any others. But I'm just saying that um, that weighs about a pound. It seems to travel really easily, um, and it keeps me fairly well insulated from from the ground. So a sleeping bag, a sleeping pad, and then definitely wearing long underwear at night is um, is key for me too. I'm not a warm sleeper. I tend to sleep cold. So having that system in place with a sleeping pad, a bag, and then wearing long underwear, and a hat too. Um, the hats as well, um, covering my head at night often helps me to keep me warm. So bring a fleece hat or something along with you, something that you'd wear in the winter time, and I think that can um, that that can help keep you warm as well. All right. So let's see here. A couple other questions. Um, more about the campground, and uh, let's see here. Are campers are campers allowed to have a campfire near their campsite, or is there just one area to have a fire? So the uh, 
the campfires can only happen within the designated fire rings, uh, and there's and there's three of those again within um, within the campground, each adjacent to the cooking shelter. So you can't build a, a campfire right next to your campground. I know that that would be really nice for warmth and atmosphere, but unfortunately you can't can't do that. So only at the um, co uh, cooking shelters can you have uh, a campfire. And let's see here. Uh, let's see, and a uh, couple others that have come up. Um, all right, yeah, so um, does the lodge have um, fishing gear rentals? They do, actually. They rent um, waders, they rent fly rods, uh, and you can purchase flies there. They're not going to rent a fly to you because, uh, you know, if you end up losing it, then um, then you won't be able to get that. Uh, get that back to them, but yeah, they do rent fishing gear at Brooks Lodge, and you can purchase your fishing license there if you want to, as as well. All right, so let's see. And um, Scott from Virgin Islands asks, if we can camp at Brooks Falls, would we be able to um, walk freely along the river? Um, as we did that on a tour. Yeah, so if you're coming and you're not on a guided tour, and I think you know, Scott, you also said that you came on a tour to Brooks Camp in the past. Uh, you know, if you came and you were just camping at, at Brooks Camp, yeah, you can you can walk pretty much anywhere you want to without a guide. You will find rangers stationed in many areas where people happen to concentrate, where bears happen to concentrate, and, and we happen to facilitate movement around bears as much as possible. So definitely a consideration um, when you come to Brooks Camp here is to bring your patience because bears often uh, prevent you uh, for periods of time from going to where you want to go. But you can certainly walk to Brooks Falls on your own without a guide, so you don't have to do that. So if you wanted to get up at um, 7 a.m. on July 1st and, and go up to Brooks Falls and be there right at 7 a.m., right as the Falls platform opens, then you're certainly welcome to do that. And um, it's almost, um, we're almost an hour in. I'm going to, I'll stick around and I'll answer the rest of your questions. Um, as best as I can here, but before we um, hit the hour mark, um, I definitely want to cover a couple of other things. Um, one of them happens to be the reservation system um, for our uh, for our campground, and um, you can find that. And let me share that screen with you here. We're going to look for here it is. All right. <clears throat> So you, um, and this is um, the test site right now. They're um, updating recreation.gov. So when you end up going uh, to make your campground reservations on uh, January 5th at noon Eastern time, that's when the campground reservations for 2014 open uh, for, for Brooks Camp. Uh, you're going to go to recreation.gov, and you're going to want to search um, for Katmai, and I already have that in here. And I'm just going to walk you through this. So uh, there's going to be, uh, you know, Katmai National Park and Preserve permits are going to show up. You, um, you know, definitely you're going to want to stay overnight. You're going to want to, you're going to want the campground. And let's pick a hypothetical date here. So, and again, this is the test site. So if you try to do this on your own right now and pick pick July 10th, it wouldn't let you do that. Two people, two nights, and from here um, you're going to be able to build your itinerary. So it's going to want you to be uh, logged in. So definitely log, or make a login before um, noon Eastern time on January 5th, and that way you're logged in, you'll be ready to go, because uh, competition for campground spots in July is pretty fierce, and a lot of uh, days fill up immediately within a few hours uh, of the uh, of the reservation time or the booking time opening. So if I wanted to, um, see I'm not logged in right now, so it's not going to let me select these. But anyway, you could you could say the 14th and the 15th. I want to stay. I want to stay on the 18th and 19th. If you were going to take a trip into the back or into the Valley of 10,000 Smokes in between, for instance. So um, there's a bunch of different options, and I really probably would base the rest of my trip on what days you can get at camping at Brooks Camp, if that's when you're going to go. Purchase your campground, uh, or 
you know, reserve your campsites first, or your reservation first for the campground, and then then you can purchase your plane tickets around that. Um, because it, it really does pay to be flexible because there may be some days on here where it'll tell you that it's not available at all on the days that you want, um, but it may be available on the 17th and 18th. And, it, and if you haven't purchased a lot of plane tickets, then maybe you can uh, reserve your spot in the campground for the 17th and 18th instead of on the 12th, for instance. So I did want to go over that really quickly. And then there was a couple other considerations that I wanted to uh, show everybody or share with everybody as well, too. So there's one more screen that I wanted to share with you here before we hit the hour mark. And many of you probably know this, um, but there's no bear-free area at Brooks Camp. So no matter when you come and no matter where you happen to be, expect bear encounters. You, it's difficult to sort of get into that mindset of thinking that a bear is around the corner all the time, but it, it happens to be true. And if you're coming at the, be the peak bear viewing times, if you happen to be coming in July and in September, it's quite likely that you're going to have a lot of close encounters. Uh, so, so keep that in mind. And when you're at Brooks Camp, you do have to follow some special rules to help not only keep people safe, but also bear safe as well. Um, you'll go through an orientation as soon as you arrive. That's really the first thing that you do. You come into the visitor center and you're given a 20-minute presentation about bear safety and about the special rules here at Brooks Camp to help pe keep people and bears safe. And we don't need to really go into that now. But do keep that in mind that it's, it is really uh, an effort that we need everyone to participate in to help protect the bears and the experience at Brooks Camp. It's a really unique and exciting experience for everybody, but bears are going to be everywhere, so we need everyone to sort of buy into um, uh, helping us protect the, the bears and, and the experience as well. And of course, you're going to end up having sometimes some really amazing encounters as well, too. When you happen to see a herd of bears, or to be more accurate, I guess a sloth or a sleuth of bears running down the river, uh, I think everyone who comes to Brooks Camp is going to find that it's a memorable experience. It's a really unique experience as well, too. Uh, so think carefully about when you want to come, whether you really want to see bears catching fish at Brooks Falls, then come in July. If you want to see lots of fat, happy bears fishing at the mouth of the Brooks River, then come in September. Uh, and then, of course, always expect the u ubiquitous uh, biting insects as well. Black flies and mosquitoes, no see -ums. Bring a head net with you and long sleeves as well. I think that seems to be a better way to protect yourself from biting insects than um, insect repellent itself. Cover up with a head net when, with long sleeves, and I think you'll, um, you'll, do, um, you'll be quite comfortable while you happen to be here. Uh, so it is a little bit after 5 o'clock, so I'm going to say that's sort of done with um, maybe the, the formal part of our um, of our hangout, but um, I started my work day at 8.30 here, um, Alaska time, so I still have some time on the clock, and I can hang out with you here, and I, I will um, try to answer uh, some of your questions here as, as, best I, as best I can. So one question that came up that is not on um, the Google Plus um, Q&A app that we have here um, is that are there any guides available to take people to Hallow Bay? And there are. Uh, so there's a link uh, and I can find that for you. Let me bring up a screen here. Yeah, I am. Mean, Let's see. Sorry, I was talking to talking to Ryan in the other room. Um, let me maximize this and share this with everybody. If you're reserving a spot at Brooks Lodge, catmyland.com uh, is the place to go. And those usually book up um, well over a year in advance. Um, so contact them, see what their booking window is, uh, and how soon they they may, uh, you can make reservations for that. But if you're looking to stay at the lodge in 2014, you're probably going to have a pretty hard time finding a reservation available or a space available for you. So, catmyland.com um, for spots at Brooks Lodge. 
But if you wanted to explore um, any options to go bear watching in the rest of the park, like in Hollow Bay, for instance, um, go to um, nps.gov slash katm, and that's the official park website. And right on the main page here is a, a list of, of guide and transportation services. So click that link, and that'll take you to a different website um, where you can find a list of guide services for all of the uh, National Park Service units in Alaska. And we have Katmai right there, and then it'll download a PDF for you. And this can get really overwhelming uh, because there are, I don't, dozens and dozens of, of services that are authorized to um, operate within Katmai itself. And they're going to be organized by the type of activity. So if you just want someone to fly you from one spot to another and drop you off, then there's a list for that. Um, there's guide services for backpacking, for camping, and then, of course, um, bear watching. Is, bear viewing is in here, too. And um, so... I would explore those those different options um, and see who's going to give you um, give you I think the the best experience that you want of course uh, and and peruse the internet as well I can't recommend any of these companies uh, so I can't tell you that this one is better than another of course um, so peruse the internet see what uh, other people are saying, and I think uh, you know, finding out through word of mouth and recommendations from other people is probably going to be the best way uh, to find a, a guide for your um, for your trip to Hollow Bay, for instance. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, sorry, I meant to say prohibited. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, again, Roy's talking over my shoulder. He's, um, you can uh, give him, if you come out to Brooks Camp and you see him, give him a hard time about um, critiquing me so harshly. So, um, he, <laughs> he's, yeah, backseat driving. Uh, he was saying I was prohibited, and that's what it really what I meant to say. I was prohibited from recommending anybody. Um, so, let's see here. Uh, so, now Nancy Wilson asked, and this is a good question as well, too, um, how accessible... Is it for an older person who can use a cane and cannot stand for long periods of time? Um, it's, you know, the facilities at Brooks Camp are accessible, but you do want, uh, when you come, it, you know, you're going to want to expect a little bit of a walk to get from place to place. Uh, from, let's say, the lodge to Brooks Falls, it's, it's about a mile of a walk. And you will find that there's benches on the viewing platforms for you to sit. So if you needed to take a break, you can certainly do that there as well, too. Uh, but um, as far as, like, benches along the trail, in instance, we don't, or for instance, we don't have any of those right now. Uh, the park is, is planning to add some, but we don't currently have any benches along the trail. So, uh, so it, the trails are, are fairly level. There are some ups and downs on them. They undulate just a little bit, but go, walking from the lodge to Brooks Falls is not like mountain climbing, for instance. There's a little bit of uphill here and there, but really hardly anything. And generally, uh, the trails around Brooks Camp are considered to be um, accessible to people with disabilities. So we've had people come here and use wheelchairs and get around, uh, but the trails oftentimes can be rough. They can be muddy. Uh, so it... I'm not going to say it, it's easy for people um, who um, who aren't uh, who who have a hard time, um, you know, walking. But it's definitely doable, and I'm, I certainly wouldn't say um, don't come if uh, if you have to use a cane and you uh, you know and you have to stop to rest for uh, for periods of time. Definitely, definitely come, but do ex do do expect a little bit of a walk, um, and and in. Uh, in September, for instance, sometimes uh, in in July too. Sometimes we have to take alternate routes to get around bears because bears are blocking the trails. So you may have to just, um, if you are uncomfortable walking through the woods, you may just have to wait on the trail for the bear to get up and uh, and move away from its nap. So that's just something else to um, to be aware of. A backseat uh, driving. With, backseat driver. A backseat driving in, again right. with September is that um, if 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 mobility is truly an issue. 
you can, um, if you come in September, you only have to walk to the river instead of all the way to the falls. So you just have like a... It's about half the distance, really. Yeah, yeah if that. I mean, yeah. it's, a, it's really a short distance, and, and so that would be recommended if, if the mobility of walking the 1.1 miles up to the falls was going to be um, more than you can handle. And it's great bear viewing in September, as Mike has said already. Okay, I'm done backseat driving. <laughs> He's done for now, at least. That's what he says. Um, let's see here. Okay. Okay, yeah, and I, I didn't actually mention how long you can stay in the campground, and I know that has come up in a couple uh, of questions in the queue. In July, you're limited to seven days, or, or seven nights in the campground in July. It's 14 days total throughout the whole season. So if you came in July and you stayed for seven days, you can come back in September and stay for seven more days, or in August, or whatever it happens to be. But in July, you're limited to seven days, primarily just because demand for the campground is, uh, is so high. So we want to make sure that we're giving at least everyone some access uh, to the campground. So seven days in July. That's, um, that's something that's come up in a couple of questions here. Um, and uh, let's see. Another question, is there a, a convenience store near the airport in King Salmon to purchase last-minute items? There is a, a small grocery store almost right across the street from, um, from the airport in King Salmon. It's... it's uh, a couple hundred yards. It's a real short walk um, and easy to get to. So, if you were looking to pick up, uh, you know, food, for instance, you wanted to pick up crackers, whatever it happens to be, um, they they have it there. So, it's a small grocery store. So, don't expect, you know, your your giant, um, you know, supermarket that you have in the lower 48. But it has what you need for sure. Um, so you can get there in the summer. Um, in the summertime, it'll be open for you if you come during the day, and uh, you can purchase your last minute supplies there. And uh, will this Q&A be available to watch in its entirety? Yes, it'll be um, uh, on uh, on YouTube, on Katmai National Park and Preserve's YouTube channel. Uh, so you'll be able to watch this whole thing. If you want to hear me mumbling and bumbling for um, over an hour, once again, you're, you're certainly welcome to do that. So, so yes, it'll, it'll definitely be there for you. Uh, let me see, a couple other questions in here. And let's see. Yeah, max stay. Max stay in the in the campground is is like I said, seven days. Brooks Lodge, though, they limit their guests to stay in, in July. They limit their stay um, to to three days, three nights. So their day is a little bit limited. There have been people in the past that stay in the lodge for three days and then they go to the campground. I guess that's a little bit of a loophole to stay longer at Brooks Camp in July. Uh, then if you were just staying in the campground solely, so you could do that, but um, but most people um, are end up doing either or. So three three nights in the lodge in July, and then seven nights in the campground. And in um, yeah, in, in September once again, I'll, just to reiterate, it's fourteen uh, fourteen days total throughout the year. So if you didn't spend any time at all in the campground. Um, in July, for instance, or up, if you, let's say, let me back up and say, if you were starting September 1st, that was the, the first night of your stay, you could stay for 14 straight days. So it's 14 straight days total, and if you haven't used any by September, then yeah, definitely, Amalia, you could, um, you can stay 14, 14 straight days in September. Okay, so um, let's see here. And a question here from uh, from Dorothy. What's the auditory experience like at Brooks Falls? Are bears quite vocal? And that's an interesting question because we don't we don't really have the ability on the on the cams to stream sound, uh, you know, throughout the day. Uh, you if, you know, and again, if you followed us on on the bear cams on explore.org. You we you've probably heard us say that we can't really turn the 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 microphones on the cams during the day because we don't want to hear people's conversations. You don't want to hear me, for instance, talking to people on the platform about um, who knows what. You want to be able to hear the bears and the gulls and everything like that. So 
of course, when you're up at Brooks Falls, you're going to hear the roar of the falls. Uh, you're going to hear the gulls quite a bit calling, especially if they're you know competing for um, you know fish scraps that the bears happen to leave behind. You're really not going to hear the bears vocalizing all that much. Bears are generally quiet when they happen to be vocalizing, except for when they're really competing for a fishing spot, or maybe a cub is begging for food off of mom. In almost all other instances, they're pretty darn quiet. So you will hear them roaring at one another. Um, you may see, hear them jaw popping, um, clacking you know, their teeth together when they happen to be um, stressed out. They're interacting with one another. They, they may huff and woof too, but really those are only happening in stressful situations. One really great thing that I like about September happens to be when you're, when you're there on a real quiet day in September and the bears are snorkeling in the river and they're right down below you, you can oftentimes hear them exhaling as they pick their head up above the water. So when they're snorkeling and their eyes are down below the water and they pick their head up to exhale and inhale, you can hear that. So I think that's a really fantastic experience. And oftentimes when the cubs are near you too and they're near mom and they're hungry, um, and they're trying to get mom to nurse. You'll hear them bawling for food, too. Um, so you will hear the bears um, making noises, but it doesn't really happen all that much. It happens actually far less, I think, than what you what you see on television, for instance. So if you're watching a movie on bears or a video on bears, oftentimes there's a lot of vocalizations going on associated with those animals. and They don't tend to do that as much um, from, from what I've experienced at Brooks Camp, at least. And how much does a beer cost at the lodge? Well, I, <laughs> Roy, do you know? I, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to reveal something personal about myself. I'm a, I'm a teetotaler, so, uh, so I don't know. I've never brought a beer at the lodge. Um, I think it's it's either six or eight dollars. Seven. 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 Okay. Seven dollars. Okay. okay seven. Thank you. <laughs> I don't drink beer okay. either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Uh, So seven seven dollars at at the lodge. So um, maybe that moderates people. I don't know. That, I think that's a bit more than what you'll find in, in the lower forty eight for sure. Okay. And um, so let's see. I'm not sure what order these are coming in at, but let's see. If there was um one way to travel by car. What is the best way to go, specifically from California? You know, there's not a lot of roads up to Alaska, and I've never driven to Alaska. Uh, there's basically two ways to get here. Um, you can drive uh, through um, British Columbia or the Rock or, or the Canadian Rockies through Alberta, for instance, and I forget the, the exact routes, but eventually you wind up on, the, on what's called the Alcan Highway, and that'll take you into Fairbanks or Anchorage, depending on what you happen to do when you happen to, to get to... Um, Alaska, you can go either way, but if you're coming to Brooks Camp, you probably want to go to, to Anchorage and catch a plane from there. Um, you can also take the ferry as well, and you can catch the ferry from Washington State, and you can bring your car up on the ferry, for instance, and come all the way there. And that can be another way um, to, to do some wildlife watching as well, too. Sometimes the, the, the Alaska State Ferry has been called the poor man's cruise. It's been nicknamed that because it's, um, it's, it is a lot like a cruise. Um, traveling up through the inside passage, it stops at a, lo a lot of small um, towns and villages along the way, and you get to see whales, you get to see bears on the shoreline, going through the Tongass National Forest, really just sort of amazing experience. And those are the two, way two ways to do it. Either drive on the Alcan Highway, eventually get yourself to Anchorage and maybe fly from there, or, uh, or take the ferry um, up from Washington State. And I forget exactly what town it departs from in Washington State. It, um, Bellingham? Okay, thank you. So Bellingham, Washington is the place to go to. All right, so let's see. Uh, so Scott from, uh, from Virgin Islands asks, and Scott, I would love to visit Virgin Islands National Park one day, so that's on my list. I hope to get here. I don't know when I'm going to do that, but I, I hope to at some point. Um, so he's asking a question about explore.org. Um, and what's the relationship between the National Park Service and Explore.org? And, and Explore.org essentially funds um, 
are, are webcams and the internet service um, that streams the cams live to the world. Because there is no way that Katmai National Park actually could, could, first of all, you know, really devote the staff to maintaining, you know, those webcams and upgrading them like we do. And second of all, also, um, the internet bill is, for this is really kind of astronomical. I forget what it is, but it's, it's, it's a whole heck of a lot. Um, so they're providing us with, um, you know, the hardware. They're providing us um, with, with technical um, um, services. They're providing us with funds as well um, to buy uh, um, other equipment and to help staff as well. And actually, uh, my salary is coming directly from a grant from Explore.org. So I'm uh, sort of inde indebted to them for being so generous. Um, as well, and I, I, I couldn't be really more pleased with the, the relationship we have with Explore.org because they're really pro allowing us to bring um, the Bears and the Brooks Camp experience to people um, around the world. And I really recommend that everyone come to Brooks Camp and experience it one day, even if you only get to do it um, once in your lifetime. It's really a, a fantastic experience. Watching the cams is really, really great as well. But I, as you know, nothing really beats. Um, what, seeing the bears in person, just like you know, everyone has to go to the Grand Canyon, for instance. Um, I think everyone has to go to Brooks Falls, for instance, too. Um, so Explore.org is really allowing us um, uh, to to bring these cams uh, to the world um, through their technical expertise, the equipment that they happen to provide, and, and the funding and the grants that they provide to Katmai National Park. So let's see here. Tell you what, I'll go to to 5:30. I think there's a few more questions. Um, so, if you have a um, a few people that are, uh, you know, if you have a few questions that you're still wanting wanting to ask, I, I can go till 5:30, and then I'll I'll have to call it a day. I'm getting a little hoarse here yeah, you need some water. as well. I got some water here. I guess this will be my what I call my Marco Marco Rubio moment. If you watched the uh, um, the last uh, presidential state of the address, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. So that, that's better. All right, so let's see here. So how many of us are, are here for the winter? There's actually uh, nobody at Brooks Camp in the winter time. So right now it's, um, it's void of people. It's, you're still welcome to visit there. The facilities at Brooks Camp open June 1st and they close September uh, 17th. That's really the last night for full facilities. Uh, but after the, you know, in, after that, you're you're welcome to go out there. So if you wanted to go out there right now, for instance, you could do so. But nothing will be open. None of the buildings will be open. Really, the only thing you can get in, into is the vault toilets out there. Uh, so no one's at Brooks Camp right now. And then Katmai National Park um, has a a full time staff year round of about thirty. You no, know, it's less. It's got to be less than that. Um, between twenty and, and twenty five, I think, full time employees. Uh, so. Uh, that's how many people are, are here for the winter, and we're all stationed in King Salmon, with the exception of a few people that are stationed in Anchorage, and their, their offices are at the um, at the Anchorage offices. Um, so we have a few people in Anchorage, but almost all of us are here uh, in King Salmon. Now let's see here. How many um, showers? Does the camp have? They don't have a. There's not a lot, um, but you can purchase shower, showers at Brooks Lodge. Um, and though I think they provide towels too. But um, again, contact them specifically. Contact Katmai Land specifically to get the, the the specific details on that. I've never had the shower at Brooks Lodge um, since uh, you know the the rangers out there have their own uh, shower facilities. Okay, seven or eight bucks and includes the towel, according to my backseat driver over in the corner there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so seven or eight dollars for a shower, um, and it, it includes a towel. So they do have showers there. You just have to purchase them, um, but they're they're certainly available. Um, let's see. Get to the bottom of my queue here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So yeah. So Scott, again, if you're um, assuming that you're spending six nights camping, 
Is there a place to get a hot meal? Um, certainly. You can certainly eat all your meals at Brooks Lodge if you wanted to. So if you wanted to bring no food at all and get to Brooks Lodge, you certainly could. Uh, even if you're staying at the lodge, I probably would recommend bringing some snacks along with you. Uh, you can't store them in your cabin. There's a different place, a different food cache where you can store your snacks in. Um, you can store those things overnight. Uh, but, uh, you know, just in case you happen to miss a meal or something like that, bring some granola bars with you, some dried fruit, whatever it happens to be that you like to snack on. Um, you can certainly... Uh, you, yeah, you can you can certainly purchase all your meals at Brooks Lodge if you want to. So if you wanted to supplement your camp food um, with a nice hot meal at Brooks Lodge, yeah, definitely, definitely do that. Uh, okay, here. Um, so Stephen, uh, I saw your question on here. I'm trying to get back to that because I know that's been there for a little bit. Kind of maybe disappear on me. And uh, let's see, yeah, Nancy asked, um, how long can people stay at Brooks Lodge in September? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Roy, do you know Brooks Lodge in September? How long people can stay there? Is it still three nights, or is it more? Um, it's three nights, but they're a lot less restricted. I think they'll let you add on some extra Okay. I think they're general. Yeah, it seems it's, the consensus between Roy and I seems to be three nights. So, I definitely check yeah, definitely definitely check there. So that might be a, a good question for them because I I can't seem to um to I or I don't know off the top of my head right now. So uh, let's okay done with that. Get a couple other questions up here. So I'm gonna again I appreciate everyone's patience as I. Scroll through here. I just want to see how the questions look here okay. in the question and answer thing because yeah. I can't run Hangouts with, with with you running it. Yeah. So the question from from Stephen, I, I think that disappeared. So if you wanted to repost that, I'll, I'll try to get to that. Um, so if you wanted to to donate. Uh, and Hot Pepper Girl is wondering if we wanted to donate to help the cams at, at Brooks Falls, where would be the best place to do that? Uh, well, you could send a donation directly to Katmai National Park. Uh, the address for making a donation is on the, the Park Service webpage. Under our, it's just our general information, and then you could put bear cam donation or webcam donation, and those would be deposited into an account. Uh, that would be used for educational programs typically. So that would include the bear cams and and, uh, and, and any other number of things like that. Uh, we already have a few people that do send us uh, some checks. Some people send them about monthly. Just make sure that you make them out to Katmai National Park and not to Mike Fitz or Roy Wood. I won't be able uh, to use it. It, it no. complicates <laughs> things a little bit if, if they're made out to us. Uh, so make them out to Katmai National Park and we can get those deposited and, and would, you know, be, it's a, it's a wonderful thing if you if you feel like it's something that you can afford and would like to do. Uh, otherwise, you know, Explore doesn't expect donations. They just are happy that people are enjoying and, and, and learning from and being ex inspired by the, the bears at Katmai or the polar bears in Churchill or the belugas in Churchill, whatever it happens to be. And um, we just have a few more minutes here. Um, so I'm going to wrap things up in, in just a little bit. But I, I know there's a couple other quick questions that I can get to. Quiet hours in the campground, um, generally 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Yeah, excuse me, 10 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. So, and um, you know, there's no one brings a generator or anything like that. So we, you know, I think the only problems with uh, with quiet hours would be if, if people happen to be a little noisy around the campfire at night. But that's that's about it. So so coming. Okay, so here's Stephen's question again. So coming back in September. Is it earlier or later better for bear viewing? You know, honestly, if you're coming in September, um, the later you can come in September is better uh, because the bear numbers continue to increase throughout the month of September. In fact, we have more bears around the end of September than in the middle of September when the camp actually happens to close. So if you can come clo closer to the closing date for Brooks Camp, again, which is the last night for full facilities is uh, September 17th, then come at, um, as late as as late as you can. 
You can stay in the campground after September 17th. You can certainly do that, but all the all the facilities will be closed. Yes. And for yeah. the first time, uh, really ever, if you wanted to come and stay in Brooks Camp Campground after September 17th, you will need a reservation, and you can do that at recreation.gov, and it'll cost half price because we'll be turning off things like the water. Um, the electric fence won't be maintained after that, so the amenities will, will begin to dwindle like each day past September 17th. Uh, so uh, if, if, if you're interested in coming late like that, you can save a little bit of money and come on the 17th, or the 18th, rather. So the and, uh, the and the electric fence will continue to work as long as there's sunlight, but you know you won't have the maintenance staff going down there and checking it frequently like, the, like they did before, too. So you can count on the electric fence working most of the time, unless a tree branch falls on it or something like that. Uh, so let's see here. Any more that I can get to? So yeah, and I appreciate everyone's um, patience today. Um, this was an experiment for me, and this will probably live into perpetuity on on um, on YouTube. So uh, if I said anything abhorrently wrong, then uh, you know you can always find it on YouTube if you want to watch this once again. So appreciate everyone's patience bearing with me. And I see one more question. This is the last question that I'll answer. It came up um, not on our, our um, uh, Q&A app on, uh, on Google+, Plus, but uh, this one asks, um, could anyone go to Brooks River any time of the year if they found transportation on their own? And you certainly could. Yeah, so it, again, if you wanted to come right now when no one's out there, if you could find your own transportation out there, you can, you're certainly welcome to do so. So Brooks Camp really never closes to the public. The facilities shut down, though. So uh, you're welcome to come at, at any day of the year if you wanted to. The park is really never officially closed. We just have the facilities closed at Brooks Camp. Uh, and I think what I'll do is I'll tr probably try to do um, at least one more of these Hangouts uh, later on this winter, um, maybe one more before the campground um, reservation system happens to go uh, live for or everybody. Um, so the, I should say before the booking period um, starts. So maybe sometime um, in early January we can talk more about campgrounds, making reservations at Brooks Camp and things like that. Um, and we'll also try to do different hangouts as well on different top different topics. So I was thinking about um, perhaps having one of our biologists come and talking about the, the coast of Katmai National Park. We can talk about hiking in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes, for instance. There's a lot of different possibilities that we can do for this. Um, so so uh, thanks for uh, everyone um, with your, your questions and your patience with this um, and joining me today. I think we had um, as many as 40 people watching, which is, I guess, a pretty good use of my time. Um, considering I could talk to each one of you on the phone, for instance, and uh, and, and have an hour conversation at least. So, um, thanks, thanks again, everybody, and um, have a good evening. And I will uh, certainly talk to you soon.